Well, this morning, I want to begin with uh, uh, an observation, a comment that we're going to be focusing on truth, on what it means to know something both in the head and in the heart, both intellectually and incarnationally. In just a moment, we'll turn to Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. But before we do, I want to share with you a story. So it takes place in Leningrad, which is St. Petersburg, Russia, 1941. 1941, the German army is approaching the city, and the staff and volunteers of the Heritage Museum, panicked and aware of what was to come, started packing thousands of pieces of artwork, sculptures, treasures, antiquities, everything that was sacred and special to be sent back east away from the intruding army. So everything's boxed up in the museum. Everything's put on trains, sent away, safekeeping, get it back after the war, except for one thing. The, well, two things. The pedestals and the frames that held all of the artwork and the sculptures. The pedestals and the frames were left exactly where they were to be hung or where the sculptures were to be placed. The idea behind it is that eventually the artwork would return. So the staff decided that because the museum was so sacred and so special, they could not risk it being destroyed. And so staff and volunteers moved into the basement of the museum. All right, there go the twins. Bye-bye. They moved into the basement of the museum, and for the next two years, Russian citizens and soldiers would walk the hallways while the staff, serving as docents, would stop at each pedestal or, or picture frame and explain with great detail and with great memory what should have been on the pedestal or what should have been hanging on the walls. They would rock through the hallways and they would say, look at this amazing Renoir or Rembrandt or whatever it was. And they would describe the painting and it was if you could see it there as if you could see it vividly, but of course it wasn't really there. But they believed that they could share through their great passion and belief what the paintings were, even though they were not physically present. So hang on to that story for a moment. That's a true story. Let me tell you a little bit about Paul and the church in Ephesus. When Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus, a church that he started, he wanted to write words of encouragement. And he starts off by, by greeting everyone, but then he gets to the third chapter. It's, it's a very short letter, just six chapters long. But in the third chapter, and we'll pull it up for our scripture today, Brian, it says this. Paul says, as soon as it gets pulled up there, for this reason, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being grounded and rooted in love. And I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now remember on that very first line, Paul says, for this reason. So as I was studying the scripture passage this week, I wondered what was the reason? Why was Paul bowed down, as he says, on one knee in prayer. What was the reason that he was writing to the church in Ephesus? Now, Paul spent um, a total of three years in Ephesus, 
And the first three months, everything was going really well. Paul said that during the, wor- uh, during the week, he would work making his tents. He was a tent maker. He would uh, work with his hands. He'd converse with others. He'd be started up in relationships. And then on the day of the Sabbath, he would preach in the local Jewish temples. First three months, splendid. At the end of week 12, though, there was a minor setback. The leaders of the Jewish temples where Paul was preaching, they became concerned that Paul was preaching a message that was heretical. And so they lashed him. And so in the Old Testament, it's a little bit of a biblical trivia, but if you, if you preach a message that's blasphemous, you get 40 lashes. So Paul says they lashed him 40 times, and they told him to go preach somewhere else. So Paul did that. He rented a lecture hall, and for the next two years, he would meet in this lecture hall, and he would preach, and he would teach, and he was really uh, catching on there in the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was a port city. It was by the sea. It was a major cultural center, so people would come in and out all the time, and of course, back then, you know, you didn't have uh, Instagram and Facebook and all this other stuff, so their means of communication was talking to one another, and they would say to one another, have you heard about this Paul guy? He's preaching an intriguing message. You might want to check it out. Paul was so influential that in Ephesus, where they had all these different religions, a group of uh, local magicians brought their books of magic and they brought them to the hall where Paul was pre- uh, to where Paul was preaching, and they lit them on fire and burned them and said that they were going to worship Jesus. Paul was uh, popular enough also that people would come and they would ask Paul to pray for their physical healing. And sometimes the prayers worked, although Paul couldn't understand why, and he reflects on that. But then something bad happened. And it was so bad that Paul doesn't really write much about it. In order to know what happened, you have to go back and read in the book of Acts from Luke. But Paul was confronted by a power that was too strong to take down or to confront. Now, the town of Ephesus as a whole, the majority of them, worshipped the goddess Artemis. Now, this goddess was a fertility goddess, and it was thought to be sent from Zeus. And everywhere in the homes of Ephesus, and you can still see this today in the antiquity markets, there in markets, there were little silver statues of the goddess Artemis. People would place these silver statues in their home, in their own little shrine, and they were assured that if they had this statue, the goddess was there with them blessing their families and their fields, their business and their livestock. And so they would pray to her in the morning and evening. They would greet her when they went in and out. They would place fresh flowers in front of her. They would light a candle in remembrance of her. And it was thought that the goddess looked after the people and that the people would be look after the goddess those who made the statues of the goddess, the silver makers. They did not like what Paul was doing. The silversmiths got together, and they said, we've had enough of this guy. He's preaching a message that we don't agree with, and he's costing us our business. So they organized a riot, a protest against what was Paul was teaching. They probably said that Paul was blasphemous or that... Um, Paul had turned against them or something like that. We don't know. But whatever happened, we do know that Paul in the city of Ephesus landed in jail. And he'd been in jail before. This wasn't new. But this time, there was no easy out. He wasn't able to talk his way out of it. He wasn't able to say that he was a Roman citizen and therefore should be set free. This time, Paul was sitting in a jail cell And he began to fear not only for his life, but also for his ministry. And he writes, and he looks back, and he reflects, and he wonders, 
Is everything I have done for nothing? Is all of this worth it, or is it just going to fade away? Now, in hindsight, after his release, he writes a letter to the church in Corinth, and he said that this experience made him trust in the God who raises the dead. Not that he didn't trust before, but he trusted God in a whole new way after being in jail in Ephesus. Now, the scholars don't all agree on this, but for me, I think it's plausible to say that the letter to the church of Ephesus was written while Paul was in jail in Ephesus. And Paul says to the people of Ephesus, this is what it's like when you're down on one knee in prayer, when you are pleading to God. Paul paints for them a picture with vivid memory, with vivid detail about what is most important. He knows that perhaps he or his ministry may never be seen again. And so with great memory and with great detail, he tells them everything that is most important to know, and he digs down deep into himself, and he finds a way to try to move forward. And Paul says, let me paint this picture for you. Let me tell you what it's about, because I'm not there myself. And here is what is most important to understand. He writes, as we saw, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So, see here, he's saying you have to know Christ, but then you have to go beyond just knowing so that, he says, you can be filled with the fullness of God. In other words, Paul wants to share his experience of what he's gone through and And we can teach and preach about Paul and Jesus all we want. We can read every book there is to gain knowledge. Anybody can know about God. Anybody can attend church every Sunday. But Paul says all of this is useless, pointless, unless you can know what the power of God is like in your heart and in your soul. Now, as a pastor, I never say to someone, Everything happens for a reason. I think at the very best, that's an unhelpful comment. But as a pastor, I also am able to see on a weekly, sometimes a daily basis, the trying moments that people have in life. When relationships are struggling, when jobs are not going as expected, when family moves away or or moves in, whatever it may be. There are times in life when you feel like you are at the very, very bottom of the well. And that's what Paul felt like in that jail cell in Ephesus. And Paul says, when you're at that moment in life, when you're bowed down on the ground, when you have tears of frustration, At that moment, says Paul, you can be confident that the one who was forsaken will not forsake. Paul is clear to say that the God of peace, the God of peace will still be there for you. So if you are, if you're going through something or if you have been something and now you're at the other side, whatever it may be, when you feel like you might be asking, is it all worth it? Am I making any difference? Will my legacy be remembered? Am I influencing my family, my home, my business, my faith, whatever it may be? Paul says to hold on, to dig down deep, to know that you can make a difference and that God is there for you. And he paints a picture of this so that we can know it for ourselves in our heads and in our hearts. And that, says Paul, is the truth of God. Through Christ we say together, Amen.